comfortably, then we shall begin. Listen to. Okay. So, just give it one second. Good, so, good evening everybody. <laughs> Yet another evening. I'm starting to really get into these evenings actually. It's lovely to meet with you and to share these reflections which are quite uplifting for me as well when I speak about them, you know, it's like I'm reflecting with you as I speak. So um, today I wanted to talk about Silanusati or Chaganusati. It's very similar, so I thought I'll put them together because tomorrow I want to talk about equanimity. Um, so these particular ways of reflecting are, again, ways of beautifying the mind, ways of um, beautifying our perception so that we can incline towards the good, towards the beautiful, and uh, through the reflection on our own goodness, our own generosity. So of course, sila means virtue, and that is a very huge part of the path. It's the whole foundation for which the rest of the path is built upon. And you can think of it almost like, you know, you want to build a really tall building. So do you want to have like just a very narrow little foundation that's not very deep rooted, or do you want to have like an expansive, really wide, solid foundation like a pyramid? Obviously, if you have something like a pyramid, not only can you build a more stable building <clears throat> upon the foundation, but you can also build it much, much higher because the base is so strong. And so our generosity in a way is very closely related to chaga. Um, chaga means generosity or giving, giving up. And it's the kind of whole thrust of the path. It's the direction of the path. This path is not one of self-interested accumulation or acquiring things, but it's a path of giving. It's a path of selflessness, of giving things away, giving away our self-views or our negative views that hinder us, giving away, you know, self, selfish grasping, giving goodness away, giving the gift of trust and safety, the gift of harmlessness to other beings. And these are really beautiful gifts. What better gifts can we give people in life? You know, you can give people material things and it makes them happy for a moment, but usually they just put it away in a cupboard somewhere or in a drawer and it gets dusty. And, you know, the uh, actual act of giving only has limited results. But when we give um, from the depth of the heart in a way to purify our motivations, to purify our intentions, and we also reflect on that giving, we can really start to encourage ourselves to incline in the right way on this path, in a way that frees us and leads towards peace. So um, in the Anguttara 8, number 29, there's a nice sutta, and I've been reading it at um, some of my sutta classes, the regular sutta classes that we do. And in here, it's really nice because it talks about um, the benefit, not only for others when we live a virtuous life, but also the benefits for ourselves. And of course, they're very, very closely connected as things always are in the Dhamma. You know, what benefits us is bound to benefit another or ideally should benefit another. And we're always looking at um, virtuous acts of body, speech and mind that are for our own and others benefit and lead away from our own and others affliction. Yeah. So in this sutta, it says that by abstaining from destruction of life, from taking what is not given, from sexual misconduct and false speech, and by abstaining from liquor, wine and intoxicants, one gives to others an immeasurable, oh, sorry, one gives to an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. And they themselves in turn enjoy an immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity and affliction. So you see it's both ways and that's really encouraging, I think. So how do we know something is virtuous? How do we actually know? And there's another nice sutta um, called the Rahula Sutta in Majjhima number 61. And again, in that sutta, the Buddha's asking Rahula to reflect, is this action of body, speech or mind going to lead to my own, others or the affliction of both? 
or is it going to be for our benefit, for everybody's benefit? And he says that not only should you reflect on that before doing that deed, but also while you're in the middle of performing a deed. So even while, for example, you're in the act of giving something to somebody, you can ask yourself, you know, how is this feeling? Even if you don't do it verbally, but you have a sense of like reflecting on what you're doing so that you do it with your full heart and with a sense of um, some pajanya, if you like, you know the meaning of what you're doing and the purpose. And you can actually find happiness there and then. You know, you can check if, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by questions that are coming in. <laughs> Maybe we can leave those till the end. Um, so we can reflect on how it feels to do these wholesome actions, even while we're doing them. And that's particularly helpful if we find we're in the middle of maybe shouting at somebody. You know, we can put the brakes on and realize very quickly, oh, this actually feels like I'm kind of breaching my good conduct. I'm sort of stepping over a line and you can actually pull back right there and then. And then also the Buddha says we should reflect after these deeds, after we perform these wholesome actions. And this, in a way, is where the silanusati or the chaganusati comes in. It's the recollection of the wholesome actions that we've done. So this is the um, a way of, in a way, um, increasing the happiness that you get from your virtue. I remember a while ago, before I was really familiar with this kind of practice, I was doing a little bit of service in the monastery where I was staying in Perth. And I didn't think it was that much, you know, just kind of moving tiles around because at that time we were building the Dhamma Hall and kind of cladding it with all these beautiful sandstone tiles. And uh, so me and my friend Venerable Upeka, we dubbed ourselves the kind of delivery or the removals team. So we'd be going around in like these little kind of trucks and sometimes also shoveling leaves, lots and lots of uh, mulch and this kind of thing. So it was really good fun. We'd often talk about Dhamma as well along the way. And, uh, and then I'd go back to my kuti and sometimes it'd be sort of after the meal and after cleaning up, it could be two or three o'clock and I'd have a little rest. And then it was like, wow, most of the day's gone. Now I only have a little bit of time left to meditate. Of course, now I don't even have that much time. <laughs> so that was quite a luxury. I still had the whole evening and the late afternoon. But uh, I'd just sit down and sometimes feel quite tired. And I told my friend, the fellow delivery or removals nun. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, what? You mean you don't sit down and recollect on all the good things you've done? What a waste, she said, <laughs> what a waste. And I was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Because what she was pointing to was something very um, encouraged actually throughout the Buddhist text that whenever we do do wholesome actions, we should sit down and recollect it not to boost our ego or boost a sense of self, but just to notice the cause and effect of being kind, of doing good, of giving service selflessly. And just see, you know, show the mind, look mind, when I perform this kind of action, this is the result, you know, other people benefit. People will come and sit in that dumb hole with its beautiful um, sandstone cladding and it looks absolutely stunning now, now that it's made and it's probably gonna last for, you know, hundreds, if not maybe thousands of years, if the world lasts that long, of course. But, uh, you know, so many people come into that hall and they can sit and meditate in the cool air. You know, it's very insulated, so it never gets too hot, never gets too cool. And even though from my perspective, it just looks like I've been shifting loads and loads of heavy tiles, think about what that's connected to. Think about the meaning of that, the purpose of that, and then you bring up so much joy. And this is also like somebody was asking yesterday about how this leads into the sequence, you know, of joy and piti, rapture, and then tranquility, sukha and samadhi. So this whole sequence into the deep meditation. And um, one nice sutta that um, I read earlier today is in the Anguttara 5, number 176. And here the Buddha's actually um, talking about this. And this is a discourse, a little... Uh, admonishment that he gives to um, Anatha Pindika, who's very famous for giving a lot of dana and giving um, food and shelter and lodgings, etc., to hundreds, if not thousands of people. So Anatha Pindika literally means like one who feeds the poor. Pindika is like rice and Anatha is like poor people. So um, I might just read the whole thing. 
So here it says, then Anatta Pindika, the householder, surrounded by about 500 lay followers, went to the Blessed One and on arrival, having bowed down to him, he sat to one side. As he was sitting there, the Blessed One said to him, householder, you've provided the community of monastics, <laughs> it says monks here, but monastics, with robes, arms, food, lodging and medicinal requisites for the sick. But you shouldn't rest content with the thought that we've provided the community with robes, arms, food, lodgings and medicinal requisites for the sick. Rather, you should train yourself. Let me periodically enter and remain in seclusion and rapture. That's how you should train yourself. So we have to actually take that further, take that deeper and not rest content with our sealer. And this is how we can do that. We can make the bridge between our good, virtuous, beautiful, pure conduct, however trifling you might think it is, you know, even if you just fed the cat or maybe you gave someone a bunch of flowers. About two or three weeks ago, I was having like a day where I felt really kind of tired and a little bit alone with my project. And somebody just sent down this huge bunch of the most colorful, beautiful flowers. And it cheered me up so much. And it wasn't, you know, just the fact that it was such a beautiful bunch of flowers. It was the goodness and the kindness behind that, you know, the volition which um, caused them to offer this gift. And sometimes also it's very lovely being a non because you're on the receiving end of a lot of goodness. Sometimes, you know, you might um, have a shopping list and my team, including Derek, send it out to people to send some food. And uh, sometimes, you know, it just says like some beans or this or that. And some people just send two of everything. <laughs> and at the time, I think, goodness, what am I going to do with it? You know, there's far too much. And then I realized, wow, it's just because they want to show how much they care. It's like, they could have just sent one, which would be already plenty and very gratefully received, but it's that going the extra mile, you know, just doing that little bit more to show that you care. And I'm sure that all of us do these things. You know, maybe you're just a, a good parent. You've made mistakes. You're not the world's best parent, but you've done a pretty good job. You know, your kids are friends with you. They keep in touch and they're getting on okay in life. You know, or maybe you've made mistakes and you're humble, wise enough, kind enough to admit those mistakes. Recently, there was a bit of a controversy about one of the translations. It was more of a loose rendering or even an original work of poetry, really, um, connected to the early um, utterances, the inspired utterances of the early Buddhist nuns in the Buddha's day. And uh, some people were quite upset because they took it as a translation when it wasn't really supposed to be. Um, and also that it was sort of published in a way that was quite ambiguous. So there was a lot of uh, upset in the Buddhist scene around it. And yesterday I just read a message that uh, Venerable Ananda Bodhi wrote, and she was one of the nuns that was involved in these poems. And it was just so heartfelt. It was a real genuine apology for any mistakes she might have made, you know, with complete humility. And then also she managed to kind of frame things in a way that was very conducive to restoring harmony amongst those who were in disagreement around it, you know, just sort of pointing out that we're all friends in the Dhamma and that she's sure that there's common ground there, you know, and how important it is to use our speech in a way that doesn't start to assume bad intentions of others, you know, not to kind of assume where they're coming from, but to give them the benefit of the doubt. So, all these kind of things are really beautiful qualities that I'm sure many of us have, and we can bring them up in our mind and reflect upon them, yeah. Ajahn Brown told me a very beautiful story a couple of weeks ago um, about a family in India that had written to him, and they said that um, the whole family had COVID because it's really, you know, rampaging through that country at this time. and. Uh, and one of the, I think the senior most family member was actually in hospital on the ICU. So they wrote to Ajahn Brahman and said, you know, it's a time of great despair, great fear, but the only thing really getting us through it is listening to your Dhamma talks. Thank you so much. It's a lifeline. You know? And he told me how happy that made him. 
And he said he was just, he could just think of that. And I can see it when he's talking to me, he starts thinking about it and he gets all kind of teary and starts to kind of get this glimmer in his eyes. And then he said to me, oh, I wish I could just go and meditate now, but you know, now it's tea time, but later today I'll meditate and, and it will really just, you know, propel the whole process. So I'm very sure that that's what he did. And I said, wow, it must be amazing when you can just tap into that goodness. And he said something that I wrote down because I thought it was so lovely. He said, yeah, those channels are open inside for me to celebrate my own goodness. A lot of people have the pathways wide open for self-criticism. And isn't that true, you know? Which kind of pathway do you wanna create in your mind? Do you wanna create this pathway that's wide open for you to celebrate your goodness? Or do you want to keep on going down this negative groove and carving a deeper and deeper track to your own kind of self-judgment, self-beration, is that right? Self-berating, um, low self-esteem, because obviously if you're thinking in negative ways about yourself, you're going to feel the emotional impact of that. And sometimes when you get very familiar with the body and the effects of the thoughts, you can feel it almost immediately you know, on the emotional body, so to speak, there's this kind of sense of dejection, <laughs> you know, everything just seems to close in a bit and go sort of dark and shadowy. Whereas when we offer ourselves beautiful words, kind words of encouragement, it opens up those channels of goodness and celebration. It encourages our mind. And so in this uh, sutta, the Buddha goes a little bit further and then he explains what happens when, um, we do generate joy and pity, the rapture of the mind, having done good in the world. So he says, when a disciple of the noble ones enters and remains in seclusion and rapture, there are five possibilities that do not exist at that time. The pain and distress dependent on sensuality do not exist at that time. And that's because this kind of happiness is different from worldly happiness. The source is different. The source is actually goodness. The source is something mental, something uh, far more refined and less coarse than the sensuality in the world. Yeah, the object, the source of the happiness is different, but also the type of the happiness is very different. And this is where the Buddha explains different types of happiness in the suttas, you know, the types of happiness that are wholesome and that should be developed and the types of happiness that are dangerous and to be feared in the sense that they're only going to lead us to more suffering and agitation. Yeah, so this kind of pity, this kind of rapture is actually not a sensual happiness, it's more of a mental one. And it gets increasingly refined as we meditate, as we practice. You know, it can be quite um, intense in the beginning. And I think that's fine. I mean, some teachers kind of say, try to quieten it down, but I think it's much better to just let nature take its course because sometimes we haven't had a lot of joy in our life or in our practice and the mind needs to actually get accustomed and used to this joy. It's almost as though we need to drink it in and get familiar with a different flavor of happiness. And once we're saturated, once we're quenched, then the whole thing starts to settle and quieten down. And that's when it starts to lead into this tranquility, the next um, stage in this process. So the pain and distress dependent on sensuality do not exist at that time. The pleasure and joy dependent on sensuality do not exist at that time. So you're substituting one kind of happiness for a better kind. It's like you're weaning off the happiness that you enjoyed as a child and you're maturing in your approach to what happiness really means. So again, in this other sutta, the Buddha talks about um, the kind of happiness that's a mental happiness that we can cultivate in our mind. And they are the happinesses of seclusion. That's actually one of the definitions for the jhanas, the bliss of seclusion, uh, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of letting go, letting go of these sensual pleasures. Yeah, the bliss of peace, upasama sukha. And finally, the bliss of enlightenment, Sambodhi Sukha. These are the four blisses of the jhanas. And it's Sambodhi Sukha, not because it's already enlightenment, but because it's leading in that direction and it gives you a sense of how it feels to let go rather than accumulate and even try to stimulate or create happiness. It's actually the happiness that's born of letting go. It's a very different kind of joy and one that takes time to tune into. And then he also says the pleasure and joy 
dependent on what is unskillful do not exist at that time. So we can even have pleasant pleasure and joy dependent on doing bad things, right? We get a quick rush, even anger sometimes gives us a kind of boost. It gives us some energy. We feel righteous, we feel empowered, you know. It gives us a sense of being in control. And this is why sometimes we, we get angry and we almost enjoy it initially because it, it makes a very strong sense of self. You know, and Ajahn Brahm often says, and I've noticed it myself, that you know, it can be scary to let go of the sense of self. And sometimes we'd rather suffer than be nothing at all, right? So sometimes we actually quite like those intense sensations, even if they're actually unpleasant because they give us this sense that we exist, that we're solid, that I'm here, you know, I matter. And sometimes it's difficult to start to disappear. But luckily this uh, path is so beautiful and so kind of compassionate that part of the disappearing is that the coarser things get replaced by the more beautiful things. And so we're not left with nothing. We're left with this very beautiful, refined happiness if we can just tune into that. So then the fourth uh, pleasure that the Buddha talks about here, or maybe it's the fifth, it must be the fifth because it's anger to a five. <laughs> when a disciple of the noble ones enters and remains, ah, oh no, that is all five. So when a disciple of the noble ones enters and remains in seclusion and rapture, these five possibilities do not exist at that time. Do you want me to go through them again? I realize that it's quite a lot in there, isn't there? So I'll just go through those five. These are the five possibilities that do not exist when one enters and remains in seclusion and rapture. The pain and distress dependent on sensuality do not exist at that time. The pleasure and joy dependent on sensuality do not exist at that time. The pain and distress dependent on what is unskillful do not exist at that time. The pleasure and joy dependent on what is unskillful do not exist at that time. And the pain and distress dependent on what is skillful do not exist at that time. Mm -hmm. So this is very nice. And I think it's very encouraging to us to know that, you know, we can have this pathway into these pleasures simply by doing virtuous acts and then bringing them up in our mind and then putting them into our meditation. So this is kind of the bridge between the joy of um, generosity and things like reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then going to sit down in meditation. And then from there, that joy is put into your practice, whether it's suffusing your body with a feeling of that joy, or maybe allowing the mind to settle and then moving on to the breath. And at that point, it starts to um, change into PT. And PT is defined as rapture sometimes, um, sometimes a kind of interest that accompanies the meditation object. So at this time, Ajahn Brahm calls it like the glue that sticks you to your meditation object, which I think is quite good because at that point, it's so pleasant to be there that you don't really want to go anywhere else. And as a result of that, you can actually start to get at ease with the PT. You can start to settle into it. And after a while, once you had your fill, it all starts to quieten down and move into the next stage of pasadi, the tranquility. And in the suttas, it talks about tranquility as like somebody walking through the desert in the heat again and coming to a lake and then finding a tree at the side of that lake with a huge um, spread. What do you call it? A huge canopy. And then just sitting down and resting up against that tree in the cool of the shade. That's like tranquility. So at this point in the process, we really start to um, be able to sit for much longer. <clears throat> First of all, the body becomes very settled. Even the breath becomes extremely quiet. And also the mind starts to really settle. There's no thoughts that very much that come up to disturb the mind. And if they do, it doesn't really matter. You stay quiet with the thought and they just don't have the fuel to continue. And after that tranquility, Gradually, when we get more and more used to it and our mindfulness keeps on building because we're not doing anything, we're not wasting energy with over-efforting or with will or force. So the mindfulness just builds and builds and builds until we start to experience sukha. And sukha is also one of the jhana factors. And I really like Charlotte Catherine's translation for sukha as contentment 
because it's a kind of happiness. Sometimes it's translated as happiness, but it's not agitating in any way. It's actually something that is incredibly full. It's like a feeling of plenty, a feeling of repleteness that you don't want to be anywhere else in the world. You're just happy to be right where you are. And you're not even thinking about the next step in meditation. As long as you're thinking about the next step, you're just blocking your progress because it means you're moving away from this moment. You're going onward instead of inward. You're moving outward. It's the wrong direction. Meditation is an inward pro process. So this kind of sukkah is a real genuine contentment, you know, as though if you could just stay with that for the rest of your life and you'd be happy. So it's a very beautiful thing to reflect on and a lovely thing to experience. And these are all ways that we can, uh, we can access the deep jhanas and this sukkah is actually the proximate cause for samadhi. Yeah. So from there, it's just natural. You're so content, the mind is not moving anymore. You know, it's not moving away from its object. And so naturally the mind and the object become one. And when that mind and the object unify, this is when we can enter into the first jhana. So without making too much effort. <laughs> and at a deeper level with the chaganu sati, and the silanu sati, but especially this word chaga, it's actually one of the aspects of the third noble truth. The third noble truth is all about the end of suffering, yeah? And chaga literally means, as I said, giving, giving up, giving away. So this is the whole movement, the whole direction of the path. And it's very freeing and very liberating for the mind. And what are we actually giving away? What are we actually giving up? Nothing but suffering, nothing but suffering, you know, the very same um, craving, you know, the kind of raga, nandi raga sahagata, tatra tatra abhinandani, it means like delighting ever here, ever there in sensuality and sensual pleasures. And also the craving for sensuality and the craving to be and the craving not to be. So these are the three main cravings, kamatanha, bhavatanha, and vibhavatanha. We're basically giving all that away because we're finding this happiness deep inside. There's no need to wish for our own annihilation anymore. Often we have these thoughts, right? It's quite common for people to get depressed and think, well, I don't really think I want to live anymore. The world would be a better place without me. You know, what good is this life? And this is a kind of vibhavatanha, it's still a craving. And you're not going to end suffering that way. You're just going to lead to more suffering, you know, because you'll just end up having a future life and getting reborn again and have to meet the same mind states next time too. So instead of that, we go inside and we learn to end this suffering, learn, end this craving by slowly um, getting a taste for a different kind of happiness, a kind of happiness that's based on something very sublime, very... Um, lofty and noble, just our own goodness in the beginning. And of course, all the inspiration that we can get from the other reflections that we've been talking about. So I wanted to do a little bit of reflection in the meditation on our own virtue, our own goodness, even if it might go a little bit against the grain for some of us. Um, sometimes the things that go against the grain are precisely the things we need to practice because there's a reason that there's an obstacle there, you know, and it's when we meet those obstacles that we have a chance to go a little bit deeper. So let's see how it goes. So please get yourself settled. Even the intention to sit comfortably is an act of kindness towards yourself. Sometimes people think they don't have any self meta but I always think, well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have self-meta. <laughs> you could have done so many less nourishing, less beneficial things.
So as usual, these are just suggestions <clears throat> that you may wish to follow. And if not, just developing a wholesome attitude to whatever arises in your mind, you can never go wrong. Simply by using the motto, make peace, be kind, be gentle with your body and mind. That's setting the causes in place. Through right intention, right motivation. And it's just nature that those good motivations naturally in time will lead to peace. So again, sensing into your body. Sometimes it can be helpful to start with the lower parts of the body, the legs, the buttocks, the parts that are connected to the ground or to the chair. Really taking your seat taking up your space, knowing you're supported and can relax. Keeping a nice open belly Nice open chest. Perhaps rolling the shoulders slightly. Sometimes we carry tensions there that are so deeply ingrained. We don't even notice we're hunching up. So just giving your shoulders a sense that there's plenty of space around them. There's your whole trunk supporting them. They can really just relax, drop down. Allow the weight to fall through the arms, into the hands. And make sure your hands and fingers also have plenty of space. Checking through your spine, including the neck. Sometimes I like to feel into that place between the spine and the skull. Just sense that there is some space there that I can feel into, perhaps just stretch a little bit. So the head tilts slightly forward. And the top of the head senses the space above. So you're just suspended, yet fully supported by the ground. and allowing the face muscles to just melt down. Gently parting the jaw if it helps. Maybe imagining space between your eyebrows.
space around the temples and cheeks. And if you wish, you can start by recollecting the gift that we've offered to ourselves by being on this retreat. Or just by taking a quiet moment to meditate if you're tuning in live. Not only have you given yourself a gift of meditation, but also a gift of support, of Kalyana Mitta, friends on the path. You are in wise company. You have made good choices. And you're a wise companion for all the rest of us. See if you can appreciate that in yourself. Appreciating not only the wisdom, but the courage it takes to join a retreat and to go deep inside. Beautiful, right motivation of trying to live a virtuous, ethical life. A life committed to kindness. A life committed to harmlessness. And everything else is parted from you. At the time of your death. These qualities are the things you can really take refuge in. That will accompany you on the way. At that time, they'll give you so much reason to rejoice in a life well lived. So let's see if we can rejoice in that now. Why wait? You might not feel noticeably blissful or happy, but can you notice that the pain and distress dependent on sensuality, dependent on what is unskillful is absent for you at this time? That is already a comfortable abiding. A 
and we can trust in any joy, contentment or uplift that arises. Because we know it's coming from a wholesome mind. You might notice the physical effects on the body as you reflect on the goodness of your life. Maybe a softening, a sense of relaxation, maybe warmth or tingling in the palms of the hands. And along with that, there'll be a very subtle mental quality. For Vedana sensation is always felt with the mind. If you wish, you can stay here. Just take the meditation, the quality of your mind into the breath or into the body contemplation, or loving kindness, whatever you prefer. For those who wish, I'd like to invite you to Bring to mind an occasion that you were kind or generous. Something that you did that you didn't have to do. Maybe you very carefully put a little moth outside. Maybe you donated to a charitable cause. Maybe your livelihood involves serving others, those who are sick. Those with disabilities or in a nursing home. Maybe you wrote somebody a kind email. Or simply refrained from saying an angry word. See if you can connect to the feeling of kindness the goodness of that particular act of body or speech and allow it to lift the heart. 
Allow yourself to rejoice. Gently opening the channels to celebrate the goodness of your life. And also learning a little bit more about causes and effects. Whenever you perform actions of body or speech, there is a sense of happiness there. You are on the path. So just letting go now of these reflections and settling down into the breath, into the body, whatever feels most natural and helpful for you. And as you just stay steady with the breath, 
contented with just this moment of breath. Allow the happiness to just develop in its own time. In the background of your mind. And if you find your mind wandering to the past, to the future, away from this moment, this part of the breath, just gently remind it that contentment can only be here and now. This moment, is good enough.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation, ready? I'd just like to offer a few words, reflections you may want to mentally go along with. May I learn to forgive myself for my shortcomings, for my mistakes. May I learn to celebrate the goodness of my life. May I learn to forgive shortcomings and mistakes of others. May I learn to celebrate the goodness in the hearts of others and in their lives. Do you feel good about yourself now? Good about your life? Is it good enough? Pretty well so far. <laughs> okay, so now is that time of evening for the Q&A. And it's Q&A Leone today, so please send any questions. And just from a... Uh, Yesterday, someone mentioned a different subject. You're very welcome to ask or mention or comment on any subject that's related to Dhamma, more or less related to life, right? So it doesn't have to be about this. Oh. That's nice, I'll start with a positive comment. See, this is your goodness too, making you very happy. <laughs> My heartfelt gratitude to your inspirational teachings given to us with joy in your heart. I've practiced your advice to send out thoughts of metta before sleeping at night and have reaped the benefit of peaceful, uninterrupted sleep through the night. Fantastic, that is your wisdom and your Wonderful practice bearing instant fruits. So it was obvious you already had a lot of metta and maybe just reminding your mind, inclining your mind to that metta before bed ensures that any hindrances that may otherwise have arisen actually get kind of knocked out before you sleep. It's fantastic, isn't it? And uh, yeah, many of the uh, benefits that the Buddha talks about with loving kindness are, due, are around sleep going to sleep easily, having undisturbing dreams, uninterrupted sleep, and also waking up refreshed. 
So, and it's important. It might seem sort of mundane, but actually, have you noticed what happens when you don't sleep? I notice that if I'm really tired, the whole world starts to look kind of dismal and grey, even without a rainy day, a rainy English spring. <laughs> it's just a matter of perception. So actually, meta practice is a wisdom practice, I feel, because it starts to show you how conditioned perception is how differently we view things with a mind of metta compared to a mind of hate or a mind of even just ordinary awareness without necessarily any overt hate, but just an ordinary kind of mind compared to a mindful of metta will perceive things and frame things quite, quite differently. So it just shows that the mind is not fixed, you know, and there's this beautiful sutta in the um, Anguttara's, uh, sometimes I remember where it is, is it? tens it's the lump of salt it might be 10.2 or something or it might be one point something anyone know i'm sure people here know it's called the lump of salt and um it's a really wonderful teaching because it basically um some people are going to the buddha and talking about karma and he's saying that you know some people can commit sort of really bad karma and uh, it has terrible results and other people um, do bad karma and it hardly has any result and he said it, basically um, it's like the difference between putting a lump of salt in this case the karma the bad karma in a glass of water or in a huge big lake so if you put that salt in a glass of water because there's not very much water there the whole glass of salt becomes really salty but if you put it in a lake there's so much water you can't even discern the flavor of the salt it doesn't really spoil the water in any way and that's the same thing with a mind which is small, brittle, fragile, full of, full of hindrances, if you like. It's contracted, it's mean, it's, you know, it doesn't have any resources, any resilience, or a mind of loving kindness, which is boundless, which is expansive, yeah? or a mind that is, you know, gone to greatness, mahagata in any of the um, jhana states. So obviously this is a spectrum and it's unlikely we're going to be either the cop or the lake, but you know, it's about the fact that it can change, right? And we notice it within our own lives. Our minds are shifting and changing in capacity and resilience and, you know, magnanimity all the time, depending on what we feed them with. So we have to learn to feed our minds with good food, you know, and not use, um, not focus too much on the weeds. It's like this simile of watering the flowers and not the weeds. So the flowers grow and eventually swamp the weeds. The other approach, of course, is to use weed killer on the weeds. But the problem with that, attacking our hindrances with weed killer, is that we also end up spraying that weed killer on some of the flowers as well. <laughs> and it spoils the soil, right? It spoils the whole place that the flowers are going to grow. So it's much, much better to focus on cultivating the wholesome qualities. Okay. Oh. So not a question, just a big thank you on this inspiring talk again. I realize that I don't usually reflect on my good deeds at all. Seems it's easier to think not good enough. Definitely, and that's not your fault either. So it's good enough that you think not good enough because that's the product of your conditioning. You know, we're all the product of the way we've been brought up. And of course, in this world, we can't dare to think it's good enough because then there'd be no capitalism, right? If it's good enough already, you don't need the latest whatever gadget or upgrade on your iPhone. You just don't need those things if everything's good enough already. So nobody can profiteer from you, which is rather wonderful, actually. <laughs> it's part of being a renunciate, you know, you're stepping out of the normal rat race, out of the society, you're saying, well, this robe is good enough. Um, I don't need kind of fancy Gucci or I don't know where people buy clothes. Is Gucci clothes? I don't know. <laughs> I used to get mine from secondhand shops even when I was a lay person or just whatever other traveler didn't want anymore. I'd get it from their backpack. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we, we often think not good enough, of course. And, and somehow we've been conditioned, everybody, I think, in every culture has been conditioned to think that if we're already content, we won't progress. And yet the complete opposite is true. 
you don't need to feel that there's something lacking or that you need to get further in order to get further. You actually need to learn to be where you already are. One of my favorite phrases actually from Ajahn Brahm is, be more fully where you already are. It's almost like that's the whole of meditation in a nutshell, isn't it? Be more fully where you already are. What does it mean to be fully where you already are? Be there with all your kindness, be there with all your contentment, with your devotion, with your trust. Be there with all your patience, you know? Be there with your whole heart. Be more fully where you already are and you're already there, so there's nowhere to go. We're always right here. It's just that we always want to be somewhere else. That's the problem. We can only live now because where, whatever you think it's going to be like later, it can only be that way once it, it's the present. You can't live it in some fantasy world. You can only live your ideas, your dreams when they become the present reality. And if we never think it's good enough, then we're never going to find satisfaction no matter where we go or what we do. So yeah. It is, it's quite revolutionary to reflect, reflect on our good deeds. I also don't, still don't do it enough, and I ought to, because I do a lot of good deeds. Luckily, some of you remind me by sending nice messages because I'm not very good at doing it myself. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It goes against the grain somehow. But there's a lot to be happy about. And when I had that uh, melanoma, I've already mentioned it a bit, um, it was great, actually, as a sort of warning, you know, because it could have been really dangerous but actually it hadn't spread um, but it could have done you know and it, it made me tune up with the kind of essence of my life and I realized that it's always been going in the right way even through the ups and downs and the times of despair and doubt and thinking I don't know what to do next I've come to a brick wall the general direction was always you know in toward good as much as I could I'm not saying I've always achieved that but given the conditions that I found myself in, given the choices that have been available to me and the resources I've had at that time, my intention has been good. And I think, you know, if we can fall back on that, um, and I think we will at the time of death, because that's all you can really fall back on, then I think we can be, we can pass away very peacefully and very content. So just remember that when you're dying, you came to this wonderful retreat. <laughs> It's not easy actually, especially online, eight day retreat. It's not that easy. Could you please explain more about metta practice in terms of addressing ill will? Are there many different approaches? Oh, I love metta practice so much. And I think there are lots of different approaches. Ajahn Pramali was um, hinting at some of those today. He mentioned about um, the sutta way of practice, which is more about spreading loving kindness in the four directions. Um, but also in those suttas, there's another passage. It's, I think it is the simile of the saw, the one where um, the Buddha says, even if bandits were to saw you limb by limb, like your limbs apart with a two-handled saw, one who gave rise to a mind of hate would not be practicing my teachings. In that sutta, before he goes to that extreme simile, he actually talks about how to deal with people who are abusing us and saying horrible things to us. And um, he says that we should not develop hate, but we should dwell with thoughts of loving kindness. And starting with that person, the difficult person who's abusing you, who's saying bad things, we should develop thoughts of loving kindness. So that's actually one place in the sutta where he talks about the difficult person. And he says, we have to start with that difficult person, which is very interesting because it's the opposite of the approach taken in the Visuddhi Magga. Um, but I think in that context, it's more aligned with how Ajahn Brahmali was talking about metta, which is more using metta as a way of sense restraint in daily life. So basically, whatever input comes to us through the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, body, or mind, and touch, body, yeah. So in this case, it's, it's unpleasant words coming into the ear sense door. So we can either develop thoughts of hatred and ill will and notice if we're not skillful that, uh, or if we have a bit of mindfulness, we'll see that we're allowing those unwholesome thoughts to generate more unwholesome states of mind in ourselves. So instead of that, at that level of sense restraint, we actually try to um, change our way of viewing it 
and resolve to abide with thoughts of loving kindness and to immediately try to address that anger before it gets really ingrained, you know, because if we don't address it quickly, we end up dwelling on it, right? There's usually not that much suffering that comes from, say, somebody saying something mean, but the suffering is when we go away with that and then we start to build a story around it and how could they do that? Didn't they know I was tired also? And they did it just at the wrong time and I'd already had a bad day and now I feel even worse and, you know, I thought we were friends or whatever it might be, or that person's just, you know, like this and like that, and it must be because of this and that. And we build this whole kind of story around it and we suffer far, far more than the actual immediate input at the sense door. So I think in that context, the Buddha's saying, you know, just don't let, let that ill will get started. Try to be patient when provoked, when criticized and um, turn it a little bit around, you know. Um, remember the example of the Buddha, exercise patience and try not to retaliate, yeah? And instead, you know, using some of those similes Ajahn Pramani discussed, try to see the good in that person instead. You know, they don't always speak like that or um, you don't have to live with them, they have to live with themselves, right? You don't have to live with them, they're suffering, they must have had a bad day. You know, you can go away and develop metta, they might not know how to do that. So this is one type of approach. And Ajahn Pramali today, I heard him say that, that we can't actually practice metta as long as there's ill will. But um, I think this means if there's ill will that's very gross at that time in the mind, because obviously if we can't practice metta until we're free from ill will, then metta doesn't have much purpose because metta is supposed to be the antidote to ill will. So the main thing is that um, when we sit down to do metta practice, we shouldn't have like the hindrances obsessing our mind. So there's a few suttas in the text which say um, <clears throat> that when the hindrances are not obsessing our mind, we can practice. And of course, it depends on each person as to how much they've, you know, been able to address um, the unwholesome qualities in their mind through their daily life we do the best we can it's like we do our maintenance in the day we maintain the i don't know the mind in this case we tidy the cupboard make sure everything's fairly neat and then we go and sit down and meditate and if we find our mind is fairly balanced but you know for example that in your life there's somebody whom you do harbor ill will towards then you can probably start practicing loving kindness and at that point, if you want to address it at a deeper level, um, the advice in the Visuddhi Magga is to not start with the person who you have ill will towards, but to start with a loved person. It actually says in the Visuddhi Magga and in most traditions that have come from that, to start with oneself. But that is predicated on the idea that we have a lot of meta to ourself. And actually for most of us, that may not be the case. There's also this notion that unless we have loving kindness to ourselves, we can't have loving kindness to anyone else. And I actually disagree with that because one thing is I think we do have loving kindness to ourselves. Otherwise, we wouldn't even try to walk the path. We wouldn't even try to eat well or to choose a job we like or to choose good friends, you know. So we do have loving kindness for ourselves. But I think that we can also develop it through loving somebody who we find easy to love and then we can bring it back to ourselves. So I usually start with a combination of sort of sending metta to ourselves, to our body, relaxing our body, and then going to the loved person or to a benefactor, a friend. And we can practice by building up the metta with that person by just bringing them to mind as if they're actually there with us, getting a sense of maybe something that we feel in their presence, maybe a sense of safety or ease. Um, maybe just thinking of them brings a smile to your heart, you know, a smile to your, to your face. Um, and if you're more visual, you can visualize them there. Um, you might recollect on some of the qualities that you admire in them just to get that sense of this is the object of my loving kindness. And then you actually imagine, in a sense, that you're offering loving kindness to them. And I usually do that by verbalizing my thoughts and intentions of loving kindness. So I might choose one to four thoughts. It's usually four in the beginning, like, because I have a little rhyme, which I quite like, like may you be happy, may you be free, may you be healed, may you be at ease or at peace. And I choose those words because they're positive. 
sometimes we say may you be free from suffering or uh, may you not come in contact with any danger but I think because words have such a strong resonance I like to choose the positive words because I think it just nudges the mind in a slightly different way I don't know if anybody's seen that video about water but I found it quite amazing it's called what's it called the, mm, the miracle of water or something like that I might have it wrong and it's um, a number of scientists including a Japanese scientist who take pictures of the crystals that water makes and they subject the water in different glass jars to people saying certain words and it sounds crazy right but the water molecules change especially when there's something like sometimes they say the words to these glass jars and sometimes they just stick the words on the glass jar like the word hate or the word love or the word gratitude and it's amazing they actually found that the word love and gratitude together produces the most beautiful intricate spectacular water crystal they even do the same with music so they play like metallica or some kind of grungy heavy metal thing and the water molecules go all kind of bleh, <laughs> ugly and you know not um symmetrical anymore and when they play some other kind of light music maybe I don't know, symphony. I actually prefer rock music. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> maybe not anymore. Actually, this is a long time ago. Um, so when they play the other kind of music, the crystals become very beautiful and completely um, symmetrical and really incredible crystals. So I find that really fascinating. And maybe that's influenced a little bit why I choose the positive words. Um, these are really scientific experiments. It's not just some kind of new age, you know, because there is a lot of stuff out there, but I think it, it's quite, it's quite a, a renowned film. So anyway, yes, we can do um, the love person and then we can move after some time. I mean, it depends. I know teachers like Ajahn Sajato, he just practices metta to himself. As far as I know, that's his main practice. Um, he may sometimes send to the loved person or to the neutral, but as far as I know, that was the instruction he was given. May I be happy? May I be happy? This is his one phrase. May I be happy? May I be happy? And that's his main method. Because you can take these meditations on loving kindness all the way into the jhanas. And for that, you can just use one person, one category of being. But I think if you really want to address the... Um, defilement, I don't like that word. Uh, let's just say, if you really want to address ill will and the tendency we have to aversion to anything on the spectrum of hate, um, it's really helpful to practice with each category of being. So the loved person, the person that you don't have strong feelings about, which is quite a neutral, we call it the neutral person. Someone you don't care much about, you're quite indifferent to, but you don't have strong feelings of like or dislike and then to the difficult person. So you build it up, you go between these categories and you see where your obstacles are. You see, you know, where the heart opens and where it still contracts and, you know, withdraws. And over time, um, it works. <laughs> I can just say it works. I mean, it might not mean you ever get along with the difficult person or you might not want to have them in your life, but you'll be able to think about them without ill will arising in your mind. You won't you know, have all this horrible resentment that you just carry around with you that doesn't serve you or anyone else. So we do these meta classes every week or every two weeks. I do these meta classes and we go through the different categories um, every time. So, you know, one week it's the love, then the next it's the loved and the neutral, then the love, the neutral, the difficult, and we go back to the beginning. And I don't know, I mean, I ought to ask my group a bit more about whether it's having some long-term effects, but I think, you know, you just keep on chipping away at that hindrance and, uh, and yes, it does bear fruit. And of course, as I said earlier, fear is an aspect of ill will as well, and it, it really helps address fear. So it's a very wonderful practice. I mean, not only that, it's purifying your mind at the root level. You know, you're purifying thought, you're purifying intention, you're purifying mental virtue, you're practicing right effort, you're learning about wisdom because you're seeing how changeable perception is, how malleable it is and how conditioned it is, right? 
And then you're entering into the jhanas through the metta practice. And once you enter into the jhanas, you have a chance to see things as they are. So as far as I'm concerned, it takes you the whole way. And I think it has that extra quality of making you a person who is easy to be around and maybe who can attract people to you to learn the Dhamma from you. And you see it, like Ajahn Bramali was talking about Ajahn Ganha, obviously Ajahn Brown. These teachers have a lot of metta and they reach huge amounts of people. There's a reason for that, you know. There might be other people, I don't know them, but there might be other people just as wise, but they don't attract so many people because they haven't cultivated so much metta. So it's a really wonderful thing to do. And actually in the case of Ajahn Ganha, he's the monk that went up to Ajahn Chah after a rains retreat. And Ajahn Chah said to the group, he said, has anybody here um, not got any more defilements? And of course they all said, oh, yeah, I've still got some defilements, you know, I've still got. And Ajahn Ganha said, me, apparently. And Ajahn Chah said, come with me. <laughs> and everybody thought, oh, what's going to happen now? Because as a monk, you can't make a claim. As a nun, you can't make a claim. It's actually a disrobal offence if you make a claim that's false. So it's a very serious matter. And even if you make a claim that's not false, it's you're still not supposed to make it, especially to lay people. It's also an offence that entails confession, I think. You have to confess. Um, so that there's not this kind of what do you call it, meritocracy <laughs> amongst the Sangha. I give to this one, but not to this one because they're still on the path, but this one's in lighter. I get more bang from my box, you know. It's to avoid that kind of situation. So um, Ajahn Chah spoke to Ajahn Ganha and, uh, you know, everybody was very curious what happened, but all Ajahn Ganha said is that uh, he told me to practice loving kindness. That was the advice because I think he probably confirmed whatever had happened. And uh, I mean, nobody knows for sure, but he basically said, now your job is to practice loving kindness because that's the way you're gonna actually benefit others. So to start it now, start it with the way you perceive everything, infuse it into your mindfulness so that mindfulness and kindness go hand in hand. Oh my goodness, I've got so many messages and I've given long answers. <laughs> oh dear, okay. Dear Venerable, I would like to thank you, Ajahn Pumalali, the team and the other retreatants for this splendid opportunity where the depths of the Dhamma have been made clear and explained in many different ways. Wow, that sounds like a sutta. The depths of the Dhamma have been made clear and explained in many different ways. <laughs> That's very nice. I know that the translation concentration is not the most appropriate for samadhi, but what about focus? This is because the place where the deepest samadhi has been first reached, the Bodhi tree has the specific name Ficus Religioso, therefore I think the Modi, <laughs> Bodhi tree may be nicknamed Focus Ficus, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Very good, jokes are contagious, he says, that's awesome. <laughs> is that just a joke or is it actually a question, I'm wondering? <laughs> it's a very nice joke, Focus Ficus, Ficus Focus, very good. Ficus means fig, but I'm sure you know that, religious fig tree. But yes, focus. I mean, one thought came to my mind that focus is more like vitaka. Focus is more like you go for the object, like you direct your mind to an object. That to me is more like focus and then vichara is more like sustaining it. So samadhi is not really the focus because by samadhi you've actually absorbed into the object. Like you're not focused on it anymore. You've just unified with it. Or <laughs> as Ajahn Sajata said, immersed. I don't, I don't mind that as a verb to say that the mind's immersed, but the word immersion sounds very strange to me. It sounds a little bit technical and I think stillness carries that beautiful emotional quality with it as well. So it's like everything comes together and then it all just settles down. So the focusing starts earlier, but again, you know, the whole thrust of this retreat has been around not making the focus happen, but putting the causes and conditions in place in the mind, bringing up the joy, bringing up, you know, virtue and really preparing and cultivating the soil, so to speak, so that when you do sit down and you have the instructions in your mind, the process will happen naturally and you'll find your mind just starts inclining to the breath when it feels ready. It's like the breath will just come up in the mind with some practice, right? And if it still doesn't happen and if you still can't stay with the breath, then it is important to look at the way you're using your mind in everyday life. Because if you're constantly, you know, kind of soiling the mind, dirtying the mind, and then coming to your meditation and expecting everything to start happening. It's just, 
it's just not realistic. You know, we have to keep the mind very clean, very bright. And um, at least if it's not bright, if it's not happy, at least develop compassion, develop some of the Brahma Viharas, you know, learn a, a kind way of relating to yourself. And then you'll find that you can relate kindly to your mind and to your meditation object as well. So yes, you can, you know, bring the breath to mind and focus on it, so to speak. But it's like, if you had a friend in your house and you just like focused on them, you know, it'd be kind of freaky, wouldn't it? But if you kind of, uh, let's say, accompanied them, or if you um, uh, befriended them, if you entertained them maybe, or were, you know, hospitable to them, then they'd be much more likely to stay. So you have to be hospitable to your breath, not just like stare it down. Otherwise it's gonna get really freaked out and just run away. So <laughs> we have to treat our breath like this very delicate little creature that's come in to say hello. And uh, you know, show it that you're there, show it some warmth and some company, but don't force it to stay. You might not be kind enough for it to want to stay with. <laughs> Okay, another thanks. I'm gonna, thank you very much for your thanks, but I'm getting to the questions now. My question is, as a lay person, what do you do when you feel you have found a teacher? Do you need to do anything per se? Does your teacher need to know or consent to being your teacher? That's similar to a question someone else asked recently and mostly no, I would say not, not with the teachers that I know. Um, they wouldn't sort of, I think for them, it's like they don't see themselves as the teacher. They see themselves more like the conduit or the vehicle for the Buddha's teachings. So it would feel almost um, that it would be too much coming from a sense of self for them to agree to be a teacher for you. Um, it doesn't hurt to still say that you regard them as your teacher. I think that's fine. But for them to sort of say, yes, I will be your teacher, it's kind of a bit strange because they're everybody's teacher in their mind. You know, they're, they're teaching the Dhamma, but they're teaching the Dhamma of the Buddha. So they wouldn't really necessarily see themselves as personal teachers to anyone, I would say. Um, that's in this tradition. Um, there may be exceptions. There may be people that I don't know that would. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, certainly for monks and nuns that I know, we have to focus on the community. We can't really focus on individuals. It's just that if people keep coming up in your life and they keep coming, say, to your monastery, then you get to know them and you build a relationship, obviously, because it's always about interaction, isn't it? And so in that sense, I mean, I might regard all kinds of people as my teacher. They might never know that. But in some ways, we're all teaching each other in many different ways. So I don't think they really need to know, but sometimes if you feel a lot of devotion arising up, you might want to say it. I mean, somebody did express that to Ajahn Mali. They said, you know, they feel that he's, or maybe they said that, I'm not sure, um, that he's their teacher. I'm not sure they told him that directly, but um, sometimes it can feel really good actually within our hearts to feel that this is my teacher. I know for me it does, um, but it is a bit different because as a monastic, you have more of a formal agreement in a way Having said that, it was only about last year, this is 11 years after being a very close disciple of Ajahn Brahm, that I actually said to him, like, you are officially my teacher, right? <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, I think that's obvious. <laughs> but I wasn't sure, because in monastic life, you have to take dependence on your teacher. And I was like, have we ever actually done that? And he was like, of course, it was like obvious from the beginning. I was like, okay, I just wanted to check. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more, I guess what I'm saying is it's more a relationship than a kind of label that you stick on it. It's more like, what is the nature of the relationship hmm. than an actual formal agreement? I hope that helps a bit. Yeah, but just keep showing up. That's the best. And it, when you do sort of get to know people personally, I find that really the best because today somebody asked, you know, um, should we ask questions or is it good to just watch quietly a person? And I think it's always a combination. Um, but one advantage of getting to know someone is that you feel much freer to ask anything. Um, and like Ajahn Brahmani said, sometimes you don't even have a question. It's just you interact with the person, you know, you just have a normal interaction. But because of who they are, you learn so much just in a normal conversation. It's like they don't respond like other people would, you know. 
For example, if I go to Edge Brown and I'm sort of worried about something, he just responds like totally unworried. Um, it's hard to explain, but it's just, it's very different. They're not buying into your stories. And yet there's compassion and there's empathy. Sometimes you, it's not sure. Sometimes I'm not sure, like, is he really empathizing? But then I realize, no, he really is. It's just, it comes out in a different way. It's kind of hard to um, put into words, but I think it's part of it is that they don't buy into your kind of limited sense of self your self limitations, the way you try to define yourself and put limits on yourself, and they don't buy into your stories, you know. It doesn't mean they don't listen and don't take it on and see that it's causing you suffering, this form of kindness, but it just means that they're seeing something bigger than that. And that's incredibly helpful. When I meditate, I feel like it's buzzing inside my head, <clears throat> and sometimes it can turn into a kind of headache. It happens especially in the late afternoon or evening. Thanks for the wonderful retreat. Yeah, that's okay. The buzzing is okay. I mean, it might be just that you're becoming more aware of sensations. And in that case, if it's leading to a headache, it will perhaps imply that there's a response of aversion or, you know, some tightening around that sensation. Um, or, it could be that the buzzing is already the result of trying too hard. That's possible that, you know, there's too much focus, there's too much effort. Um, and maybe then it's turning into a headache. Sometimes I have this um, after being on Zoom a lot. It's sort of buzzing and it's sort of headachey all at once. And then I realize it's just because there's been a lot of input, there's been a lot of stimulation. So what I try to do is just sense that feeling, but don't let the sort of pain take my mind inside like because pain sometimes feels like it's contracting physically the mind also contracts physically and it's like the whole thing starts to squash so I instead make my mind bigger than the headache if if that makes sense and go to the edge of it and give it space I kind of give it space I imagine it's sort of seeping out and sort of flo floating away <laughs> not to get rid of it you know but just giving it sort of a wider container and making sure my mind is not contracting with it or trying to like resist it in any way. So that can sometimes help, but yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It might be that it's just quite a lot, you know, we're doing quite a lot. And uh, yeah, you're saying when you meditate rather than when you watch the talks. Um, so yeah, I would just try to relax, just try to relax, give it some kindness. You could even imagine like Ajahn Brahm sometimes teaches, imagine your brain is like under a blanket going to sleep. <laughs> Tuck it in, tell it, you know, it can put all its lights off for a bit. Its circuits don't have to be operating. Now you're going into the mind, you're going into the heart. So bring your awareness into the heart and away from the head a little bit. Give your mind, give your brain permission to relax. Oh. Thank you so much for sharing such a beautiful practice with such care and sensitivity. When we feel though, it can be so hard to access the metta. What do we do to support ourselves in this case? Yeah, I think when you say access the metta, sometimes we define the metta as a certain feeling or a certain emotion, and it isn't always the case. Sometimes the metta is just the way we relate to ourselves. It's just a sense of kindness to however we feel. So if we're feeling low, the metta is just, you know, being with that lowness in a kind way without wanting to get rid of it, without wanting to, to change, just keeping company and being friendly with yourself when you're low, you know, not kind of saying, oh, I shouldn't feel low, I should feel better than this, I should really, you know, be experiencing love and joy. No, it's really okay to feel low. A wise friend, a friend with lots of loving kindness will accept you when you're low, when you're high, when you're everything in between, you know, and they'll still be friendly, they'll still be there for you. So, but if you're feeling low to the point of getting a bit down, feeling a bit sad or teary, I usually just sit with myself and put my hand on my heart or on my belly if I'm really feeling like I need the company and I need the physical touch. And I just kind of establish an attitude of compassion. It's really hard to put into words how it works, but it's almost like just infusing more warmth into the knowing, 
just infusing it with some more warmth or sometimes imagining like a compassionate person that I know if I can't get the feeling of compassion or the attitude of compassion imagine the way that maybe the Buddha would look at me or a good friend would look at me and just give it that smile give myself that smile as if I'm like my own big sister looking over me looking out for me you know so it's like you're accessing a wiser part of yourself that sees what's happening but is not completely identified with it. There can be a space between the lowness and the knowing mind that's aware that it's low. And in that place, you add the warmth, you add the kind way of relating to the lowness. So the lowness feels like a little bit seen, you know, it feels like, oh yeah, she sees me, she cares. And that's usually enough. Yeah, and then it just, it just goes when it's ready to go. But it also knows that you're not going to kind of shoo it away or scapegoat it. And so you get more at ease with all these different feelings because of that. So when you're more at ease with them, they tend to affect you less. They can be there, but just because you feel low, the mind doesn't have to be low, if that makes sense. There's a part of the mind that's still cultivating kindness, compassion, etc. Okay. Oh, somebody's put in the, um, yay. The video, yeah, that's only one of the videos, actually. That's him, though. That's the Japanese scientist, Dr. Masaru Emoto, Water Consciousness. So I think that's his own bit. But this other one that I mentioned was like a whole hour and a half documentary, including that particular scientist. But anyway, that's all also good. If I get the name of the other one, I'll let you know. It's really weird. It's like almost in my head, but not quite. But yeah, it's really good. It's really good. It's amazingly beautiful, those water crystals. Regarding disappearing and the desire to do so, not in a negative sense, by the way, is this still a form of vibhava tanha, which is not helpful on the path? Yeah, it's a fine line. I do think that the desire to disappear, it depends how strong that desire is and whether it's causing agitation. If it's causing agitation and it's kind of incessant, then certainly I would say it's kind of going on the side of Vibhavatanha. Um, because the thing is, it's Vibhavatanha and Bhavatanha whenever we still have self-view. We still think there's something in here that we want to disappear or something in here that we want to continue. And it's that self-view that makes it, the clinging arise. Um, so... Yeah, there's, I mean, before the stage of disappearing, there's a few other things in the sequence. And one of the first ones is Nibida. And Nibida is already a kind of tricky one to translate and it's a subtle thing. And if you look at the sequence in which it occurs in the suttas, it's usually happening after um, Samadhi. So it's already happening after you're really, really balanced mentally you know and really resourced a lot of loving kindness not very much aversion to the world at all if any um but just a kind of turning away from the world so sometimes it's translated as disenchantment sometimes it's translated as um how does that remember? he translates it as aversion which i find really weird because i think that just confuses it with actual aversion which is based on ill will um and Ajahn Brahm calls it repulsion which, or revulsion, which even though it sounds strong, I think is better because it's like a turning away. So repulsion as a kind of, is that an adjective? Sounds pretty strong, but if you think of it as being repelled, that makes more sense to me. So it's like you see the suffering in the world, you see what causes it, you see where it goes. And you just don't want that anymore. You just decide to turn away. It's like the mind naturally is repelled from it. It turns away from the path of suffering and towards the path of peace. Yeah. So that's kind of Nibida. And, and Ajahn, Brahma, Ajahn Brahm also calls it samsara's ejection seat. <laughs> he has these amazing, because he's so clever, you know. He just has these amazing... Uh, catchphrases that just capture it like nothing else can. Samsara's ejection seat. It's like you just decide, you know, okay, I've had enough. But it's on the back of deep samadhi. It's on the back of a different kind of happiness that's already well established. 
So at that point, it's less likely to go into sort of the negative one, which is aversion. I mean, sometimes um, people mistake aversion for nibida, but actually it's just ill will. So it's the same with disappearing. If the nibida still has ill will, then the viraga, the disappearing that follows the nibida, will also have some ill will because it's not yet purified enough. Um, if it's real disappearing without desire, then it's natural that when you turn away from suffering, it disappears. It's just part of a natural process. So it just disappears because you're turned towards something else. It's like when you're with the breath and when your mind is settling and it's finding joy in the breath, then the thinking starts, you turn away from the thinking, nibida, the mind is repelled from the thinking and the, the thinking disappears, right? So that's the thing. It doesn't really work with desire. Having said that, I wouldn't worry about it either because I started the path with a lot of desire to disappear from samsara and it's actually not a bad aspiration, you know? I mean, if it, if it wasn't a good aspiration, there wouldn't be any monastics, I'm sure, because we ordain, because we sort of understand to a degree the suffering inherent in samsara and, you know, we want to end that samsara or at least take steps towards ending it as many as we can in this life. So there's definitely a desire to um, go beyond suffering. But the problem with the desire to disappear and the Vibhava Tanha is that it's based on too much self-view. So the way for that to actually start to dissolve is to see that there's nobody in here anyway. So we don't have to worry about disappearing. We just have to be, you know, um, to allow the process to put the causes in place for the process to naturally unwind. So I think this is also one reason that Ajahn Brahm focuses so much on happiness and joy in meditation, because otherwise we can really focus on the wanting to get out of these things, that it can lead into um, negativity and even sometimes despair. So in some traditions, they call it the dark night of the soul in some of the Vipassana traditions. But um, other people would say that that's imported from Christianity anyway and doesn't really occur in Buddhism. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely good to allow the disappearing to happen more through joy than through wanting it, wanting things to disappear. And the joy is an antidote to that craving anyway, because when we're content, especially, there's no place for craving to arise. Contentment's wonderful. I think it's my favorite quality. I don't know, can you have favorite qualities? Kindness is another one, but contentment is even a bit deeper. Because contentment really is the antidote to craving and aversion. It's really going in an opposite direction. So I think that's all the questions. So we're only a little bit over time. Thank you for the jokes. Thank you for the lovely feedback. I'm very, very happy to know that people are benefiting from this retreat. And I look forward to our next full day tomorrow. <laughs> so take care, everyone, and sleep well. Practice loving kindness before you sleep. And bit by bit, your heart will start to develop in these qualities. 